so this is about the uh, distribution of the ingredient materials in concrete and this of course both of them are very good in compression but very very poor in withstanding uh, tension and of course flexure okay. its strength tensile strength is almost negligible even plain cement concrete the tensile strength is an order of magnitude or a couple of order of magnitudes lower than that of its compressive strength so is the case with the masonry so it's very poor in um, uh, withstanding tensile load obviously it's very, very poor in withstanding uh, flexural loads the flexural bending uh, as i said it's good in compression okay so but the difference in uh, masonry and concrete is very interesting um, of course both of them are brittle okay they break very easily without any warning uh, the advantage uh, with masonry is that the crack patterns are more or less pre defined most of the times it's the interface between the uh, mortar and the neighboring masonry unit which is the weakest joint okay so you can expect cracks to appear over that whereas in concrete uh, the crack pattern is quite irregular when you crush concrete Okay, you are going to get an hourglass failure when you test a concrete cylinder. You may get vertical splitting, and the cracks may pass through the uh, aggregates, the coarse aggregates, or it may be at the interface of the coarse aggregate and the neighboring cement base, okay, or it can pass randomly. Okay, so the advantage with concrete is the fact that because uh, the ingredients are dis distributed randomly, okay, it has to be poured into a container or in a former. that's very very important you you have to pour concrete okay into a mold whereas masonry cannot be poured it has to be constructed okay. that's a major disadvantage in masonry you need to construct masonry whereas concrete can be poured to that extent the skill set required for concrete is is rather negligible when you compare it with that, that with the masonry ironically this becomes an advantage for concrete and disadvantage for masonry because you have formwork you are going to pour concrete into that formwork you can pre place the reinforcement into the formwork okay and its negligible tensile strength can be negated okay uh, by the presence of the reinforcement in concrete okay so that's when concrete becomes the most popular construction material reinforcing and concrete reinforcing masonry is on the other hand is very difficult okay when i say difficult uh, the reconstruction process is difficult. Uh, on this slide you can see uh, the example of a very complicated uh, concrete uh, reinforced concrete uh, formwork being done okay uh, it could, uh, even in bangalore you can see on any of the metro cities you can see complicated structures like uh, the flyovers and the metro piers and things like that you, you see a lot of complicated uh, reinforcement pre placed into the form so you can pour concrete and these days pourable concrete are very popular okay it can go into the nook and corner and it becomes one huge homogeneous massive and robust structure when it is not like that it has to be constructed it still depends on the skill of the construction worker okay mason plays a very important role in this it's almost bordering on the verge of being an uh, art okay uh, and compared to concrete okay. obviously for a civil engineer uh, concrete is a smiley okay whereas mason is a frowning tend to think that mason be uh, cannot derive the benefits of concrete at least as of now okay? uh, concrete has far out outshone uh, mason be in many of the structural aspects okay so it of course the rules change if you are an architect architects simply love mason be okay it's no wonder that at one point in time all the seven wonders of the world was made of mason be especially exposed mason be is something which everybody likes uh to summarize uh the advantages of masonry okay you don't need formwork ironically that becomes a, a disadvantage also it plays several roles the dual role is functional and structural okay uh, it also plays an architectural role it's economical very very economical okay it's something which is very very important for us to realize uh, majority of the building stocks in bangalore in india not bangalore sorry in india okay nearing 90% of the building stocks in bangalore okay, are made of masonry if it were not economical it would not be in use for several thousands of years of course it is durable okay because it's durable because it does not have a corroding material in it you don't have any reinforcement 
get itself corroded. So therefore, it is durable. It is aesthetic. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I always used to think that, okay, uh, maybe a couple of decades back or more than that, I used to think that, of course, masonry cannot be made that time, or I, I thought that masonry is not that time, but I know, know for sure that masonry can be made more ductile, perhaps as ductile uh, or even more ductile than reinforcing the property. And these days, there are a host of uh, masonry units which are extremely light in weight. Okay, you've got hollow blocks, you've got the aerated blocks. They are so light. In fact, the aerated blocks are lighter than timber itself. Okay? So we used to think that masonry is brittle and uh, heavy, but it's no longer the case. Okay. The disadvantage of masonry is the fact that structurally it is very complex. It's ironical that one of the oldest construction material is structurally very complex. Okay? And there are far too many variables to handle. That's the reason why you don't have any popular softwares to analyze masonry structures. You still have to rely on um, software such as uh, final element analysis to understand masonry, the structural behavior of masonry. Whereas for analyzing uh, framed systems, you've got uh, fantastic uh, tools to analyze in a jiffy. Okay? So masonry is structurally quite complex, despite the fact that it's such a commonly uh, used term. Uh, unreinforced masonry uh, uh, is something which I'm going to discuss in the next uh, few slides. Okay. Uh, basically, the elements of a masonry structure, uh, they are called as, dominantly in a building especially, they are called as walls. Uh, unlike uh, beams and columns and footings and slabs in a framed RC building, in a masonry structure you have got walls. Okay. So walls and the foundations corresponding to that. It has to put it in a very simplistic manner. It has got only three roles to play. Uh, very simple and straightforward. It has to resist the vertical compression, the gravity loads. It has to resist the out-of-plane bending okay. uh, in the event that there is a lateral load. The walls of a masonry wall could be subjected to out-of-plane bending. That is, the forces are normal to the plane of the wall. Or the forces could be in the plane of the wall, in which case it has to withstand in plane shield. Okay. So you can imagine uh, a two-dimensional uh, object, okay, you can uh, take a two-dimensional object uh, and imagine that it's a wall. Uh, the forces perpendicular to that uh, two-dimensional object is uh, uh, the one which is going to cause bending. Okay? Uh, it has to withstand that amount of uh, bending and uh, the forces in the plane of the wall, okay, uh, leads to shear, okay? so it has to withstand the shear. So these are the three roles which masonry have to play. Uh, of course, in unreinforced masonry, it's a given that okay, no part of the masonry structure should be developing tension because tensile strength of masonry is virtually negligible. Okay? So, uh, when you want to design this uh, masonry wall, you need to take a lot of um, factors into consideration the height of the wall, the length of the wall, the thickness of the wall, what are the loads acting and how it is acting, whether it's a distributed load or a point load. And whether it is acting axially or eccentric, and so on and so forth. So there are some guidelines given, and then you are going to use those guidelines, and then you are going to understand the properties of masonry, the property of the masonry units and the jointing material, and then you try to understand masonry. One of the misconceptions of masonry is that if the block is good, the masonry is also good. Okay. Uh, it's not like that. It, it's akin to telling a concrete engineer telling that if the aggregate is good, concrete is good. Okay, it's, it's not like that. Uh, so in masonry, just like you test concrete cubes or cylinders, you are going to test what is called as masonry prisms. You need to understand this. You, call, you can have a variety of masonry uh, uh, units and variety of uh, models. Okay, so if you want to understand masonry, okay, uh, you need to cast these prisms. There are guidelines given for casting these prisms, just like you, there are guidelines for casting a concrete cylinder or a cube. So there are guidelines given. You need to cast them and then test them to understand this. Needless to mention, okay, shorter the wall, okay, more is the strength, okay, more is the load carrying capacity. Slender it becomes less resistant. Okay? And when it is slender and when the loads are acting eccentrically, these, the load carrying capacity comes down significantly. 
these are plugged in in the form of what is called as centerless ratios. Okay. So the geometrical uh, parameters which is going to influence the centerless ratio and the eccentricity of the load okay, leads uh, to one important factor called as a stress reduction factor. Okay. So if a short uh, wall, if a masonry prism is capable of withstanding one unit of load, okay, as it becomes a wall, it can carry only a fraction of that one unit of load. Maybe if the strength is one megapascal, as a wall, it can take only about 0.2 megapascal or 0.3 megapascal. Okay. So that's the sort of reduction which you have. Of course, there are factors of safety plugged in. Okay. Uh, so unlike any other uh, material, masonry has got a huge factor of safety. In fact, the factor of safety as we use today is uh, four. Even in soil mechanics, we may not be using such a high factor of safety. As I said earlier, it is because of the uh, variables, too many variables. Okay? It's dependent on so many factors, the workmanship, the type of bonding, uh, the interaction between the mortar and the neighboring uh, mason unit and so on, so on and so forth. Okay? So there are far many variables which affect the stem. That makes it, uh, uh, I mean, that leads to the fact that we need to have higher factors of safety. So symbolically, uh, masonry, uh, uh, I have shown the three uh, roles which it has to play, which stand the vertical load, which stand the out of plane load, and which stand the in plane uh, load. Okay. That's, that's the role of a wall. Okay. So the structural action of that. To compare masonry uh, as a load bearing element and the RCC as a framed system, uh, it's very simple and straightforward. In a load bearing uh, system, uh, the footprint of the load uh, bearing elements, namely the walls, okay, are the ones which are going to carry all the loads. So the footprint is distributed all over the building. Okay, Every component in a load bearing element okay, participates in withstanding the gravity loads and the ladder loads. Whereas in a framed system, there are discrete isolated elements, which we call them as columns. They are the ones okay, which is going to withstand all the uh, gravity loads in the ladder. So to that extent, masonry is uh, more efficient in the sense that you are completely mobilizing the footprint of the uh, building. Whereas in case of RCC uh, buildings, uh, framed systems, the infill is quite literally an infill. Okay, It does not participate in uh, any structural action. Maybe it can add to a stiffness, a little bit of stiffness when it is subjected to lateral loads. But apart from that, it's just a functional uh, component. It just segregates uh, two parts of a building. That's it. It does not have any structural role to play. Okay, so that's the essential difference. Here comes my first point of basically being structurally efficient, and therefore, obviously, any structurally efficient material needs to be sustainable. There's no doubt about it. Okay, you are completely mobilizing all the uh, uh, potential of basically. Okay, so this is the first point where I'm going to tell that it's a sustainable material. I'm going to use several of such pointers to make my case that masonry is sustainable. I'm sorry, there is this repeat of the slide. Okay. Uh, uh, Madam Navneeta, my, uh, am I audible and is the screen visible? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, yeah because uh, talking to the screen is uh, very uncomfortable. It's yeah. clear. <laughs> okay. Uh, before I go to some historic masonry structures, okay, I would like to emphasize that uh, the uh, code IS 1905 uh, for uh, unreinforced masonry. Of course, there is a new code which is available for design of masonry, uh, reinforced masonry as well. When you talk about unreinforced masonry, uh, there is a caveat which is given in the sense that no part of the structure, or namely the walls of a structure or any component of the structure, should be developing tension. Very, very important. Okay. So whatever may be the loads acting on it, whether it's a combination of vertical load and lateral loads, you have to ensure that eventually the resultant passes through the middle third. As a consequence of which, okay, uh, earlier masonry structures, they used to have a large base width. Okay. Some of the examples which I'm going to show, uh, there, there, there are examples where the base width is so large, okay, they used to ensure that uh, the resultant passes through the middle third, no part of the wall is subjected to tension and it, it would withstand all the lateral load and uh, vertical load very easily. Okay, so it used to be uh, uneconomical and structurally uh, inefficient. Okay, so but nevertheless, okay, 
with this caveat, there have been fantastic structures which have been constructed. And I'm still amazed at, uh, at how people construct such unreinforced building. Uh, here we go, yeah, I come to the third part of my lecture. I'm going to take a few examples of uh, masonry structures in South India. Uh, as I said, I was fortunate to be associated with trying to understand and observe these buildings. Okay. Uh, on the left hand side, of course, you see my, uh, my uh, teacher, Professor Jagdish. Okay. This is a very popular uh, masonry building in South India, in Tajawur. It's, it's a nine-story uh, building, actually. Okay. You can count the number of floors. It's nearing 250 years old now. Okay. The entire watchtower is constructed in uh, brick using live water. There is hardly any distress in this structure. Virtually no cracks in this entire structure. The walls okay, or whatever you see, the vertical elements, uh, sort of uh, pillars and columns, okay, and the arches and the roof, okay, the jackass roofing, they were all made of, uh, they are all made of uh, masonry, unreinforced masonry. Uh, no cement, no steel, okay, lime and uh, brick. Okay. It has withstood the test of time. Okay, Multi-story building. And uh, it has satisfied that condition that okay, no part of the structure is uh, developing any uh, tension. As you can see, it's so neatly configured. Okay, as you come towards the base, it is becoming larger and larger to ensure that no part of the structure is going to withstand tension or develop tension. Okay. So this is where I call uh, the fact that I, I, I make the statement that uh, the uh, the structural caveat which is given is exploited completely in the architectural uh, beauty. Okay, so it has got the uh, both the benefits of uh, the structural action and architectural beauty. Okay, that's the first potential of masonry which, which has been uh, derived. Okay, uh, in tune with the uh, title of my lecture. Okay, uh, I will go to quite a few examples. Okay, um, there are umpteen number of examples, thousands of examples. I'm going to take up a few examples. The one on the right hand side, of course, is not in, uh, not in India. It's one of the heritage uh, structures, the UNESCO heritage structures, the Roman viaducts. Uh, it is supposed to be more than uh, 2000 years old. The one on the left hand side is in uh, Bijapur. So you go to Bijapur, there are a whole lot of uh, variety of masonry structures, right from the gold boomers and so on and so forth. I just wanted to show one small example there. It's a there's a two dimension structure, it's a large uh, arch opening is there. The arch opening was so large that I had to come quite a far distance away from the arch to take the photograph of the arch. Despite that, I could not take the complete uh, arch. So you see uh, two of my friends, um, uh, Dr. Krishna Kedar Kumaste and uh, architect uh, Pankaj Modi, uh, okay, uh, they, uh, that gives the sense of proportion of this uh, structure. It is in, uh, uh, basalt stone, lime mortar, no reinforcement. Okay, so you can you can imagine the concept of stability over there. Okay, this is yet another iconic uh, city building. Uh, I'm sure most of you know this. Okay, it's a it's a famous uh, Ibrahim Rosa uh, monument uh, building in uh, in uh, Bijapur. Okay, uh, Bijapur is of course well known for its gold compass, but uh, this is uh, architecturally more intricate. A lot of embellishments in that. Okay. So it has got a basement and a podium and of course you can see one dominant floor and you see a lot of minarets, very slender minarets. The entire building has been constructed using uh, basalt stone in uh, lime water. You don't have any reinforcement anywhere, you don't have any cement used anywhere. Okay. Absolutely uh, uh, well configured Okay, such that there is no tension developed anywhere. Okay. So, uh, in fact, you can also see the several embellishments in the form of corbels and things like that. Okay, so this is where I, I tell that uh, the complete potential of masonry has been exploited. Okay, in fact, the domes of such uh, buildings uh, were inspired by nature. Okay, so the minarets of that uh, dome okay, were inspired by the, uh, the queen of flowers in India. Okay? So, the Persian architects were able to imitate uh, nature. Over that. Okay? So, of course, quite a few other build, uh, buildings, okay, uh, the uh, reverse curvatured arch, okay? a double curvatured arch, okay? multi-centered arch, uh, unfinished one. Okay? This is in our uh, Chitradurga, okay? uh, the composite masonry, earth filling or earth backing and then uh, stone uh, front. Okay? So 
almost uh, at a stack basically. Okay, one of the entrances in that. Okay, you can see uh, uh, the fact that it has been used as a beam. Okay, so the corbelling ensures that the uh, dominant mode of uh, failure is not bending. Okay, so if the dominant uh, it, it gets converted into an arch action. Okay, it's subjected to compression property. So that's something which I just wanted to tell. Okay, so despite it being a beam, okay, uh, the action is arch action. So here is yet another example of an arch. Okay. This is uh, uh, the entrance of the uh, famous fort in Bidar. Okay, uh, it's an extremely beautiful uh, fort, very tall. Okay, so you can you can uh, gauge the proportion of this uh, uh, entrance uh, arch opening through this photograph. Okay, and you can also see the thickness of the walls. Okay, uh, people wanted to ensure that the resultant passes through. Uh, the one on the left hand side is one of the oldest universities okay, or uh, um, uh, study centers in, in South India, the Ibrahim, I'm sorry, the Mohammed Gavan uh, Madrasa. Okay. So, a lot of uh, studies used to be there, okay, mathematics and astronomy and so on and so forth, of course, apart from religious uh, scriptures and things like that. It houses uh, a minaret, okay, which is equivalent to nearing an eight story building, okay, a very slender minaret. An eight story building, it's constructed in brick and lime mortar, okay. And uh, it has got a spiral staircase inside that you can go to the top of that minaret. Okay, there is a watchtower over there, and as you go to the towards the top, the diameter comes down to as less as one meter. But as you come to the base, the diameter is quite large, it's more than two, 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 two and a half meters. Okay. Again, it's a three story building, and Beezer is also well known for fantastic masonry. Monuments. Okay, the Astor complex in Bidar. Okay. So, uh, you can see one of the uh, domes which has collapsed partially, or it has collapsed, and then it has demonstrated its thickness. Okay. Uh, a few more examples. I'll sort of brush through these examples. Okay. Uh, this is a very interesting. Uh, of course, you can uh, quickly realize that it's a temple uh, structure. This is in Sandu. Okay. Uh, there is some kind of an interlocking stone arrangement in this at the plinth level and up at the upper level. Okay. So it, it, it seems and it's like an interlocking uh, uh, blocks. Okay. So the stones are carved in such a manner that you can place one above the other, something akin to a, a Lego block. Okay. So it's a very old structure. <coughs> it has been stood the test of time okay, surrounding an environment. I, I used to think that this is a very unique structure, but to my surprise, just about a couple of years back when I went, went to Lakundi, I could see similar examples. So it's 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 a fact, it's, it's a testimony of the fact that okay, so people used to translate the technology, disperse the technology. And, okay, so in Lakundi, there are quite a good number of monuments in a similar concept. Uh, I come to some recent examples. Uh, recent, uh, I'm talking about about 100 years back. Uh, this is something which is um, in Mysore. Uh, there is this Jalakshmi Vilas mansion. Okay. Uh, in, in one of the complexes, there you've got a huge dome, okay, masonry dome. Very interesting, the polygonal dome. Okay. The polygonal dome is uh, uh, a, when you cut it but in the vertical plane, it is semicircle. When you cut it in the horizontal plane, you get a polygon. Okay. In this case, it's an, uh, it's an octagon. So, I'm sorry, it's a hexagon. So when you cut it in the horizontal plane, you get a polygon. When you cut it in the vertical plane, you get a semicircle. Okay. Such a type of dome is called as a polygonal dome. And the polygonal dome is also uh, stiffened with the masonry ribs for that. What is interesting uh, is that okay, uh, you see uh, openings the uh, uh, dome. Okay, uh, a dome with an opening is something which is very complicated to analyze. Okay. You need a lot of complex, uh, uh, very intricate. Uh, analysis uh, tools to understand this. But yet people used to uh, construct these and uh, try to come out with thumb rules okay, for the thickness of the dome and the uh, handling the lateral thrust, okay, which comes uh, things like that. People had some intuitive knowledge okay, and they, they have been constructing such fantastic structures. And as you can see, the, the uh, cylinder below uh, is going to negate the horizontal thrust. Okay, so that's something which I just wanted to share. Uh, masonry is not only popular for buildings, it has also been used for uh, structures. Um, of 
puts most of you know this uh, KRS lab it's basically uh, it's constructed using lime surki mortar but this is an example of a uh, dam which is constructed uh, before krs was constructed the manivela saga dam near uh, chitradurga okay uh, it's a fantastic example of uh, uh, masonry dam uh, it is in stone in uh, lime mortar lime surki mortar the lime surki was made at the site using nearby sources of lime and to this day you hardly have any leakage in the structure Okay, such a beautiful structure. Okay, structurally so efficient and functionally uh, so very efficient, so durable, withstanding. Okay, you can't imagine a modern day uh, dam being constructed with plain cement concrete. Okay, you just cannot imagine. Okay, so I could go on with several such examples. Okay, I, I just want to keep, uh, come quickly to uh, the few aspects, structural aspects. Uh, okay, I included this slide uh, as a uh, last-minute uh, inclusion. Uh, this is uh, something which uh, my students are studying, okay, as a part of their project. This is the All Saints Church in uh, Bangalore, uh, in Brigade Road. Uh, it's a very beautiful, uh, innocuous uh, masonry building. Okay, it's more than a century old. It is in uh, random rubble, okay, and uh, there are beautiful arches, Gothic arches, okay, and the architecture is, itself is so beautiful. So uh, it's it's not visible from the uh, most of the uh, neighboring roads. You have to go uh, a little bit inside the gate to have a look at this beautiful thing. Uh, one more example of uh, uh, load bearing masonry construction, multi storied in the modern day context uh, in uh, Pune and uh, Maharashtra. Of course, uh, architect uh, engineer Ganesh Kamath uh, has been trying to promulgate the use of uh, masonry. Okay, he was uh, perhaps uh, the, uh, the first and pioneered in the, uh, sort of constructing multi-storied masonry buildings in India. He, in my opinion, I think he is one of the first to be using hollow concrete blocks uh, for construction of multi-storied buildings. Okay, it's not a framed system; it's a load-bearing system. Okay, an insulated load-bearing system. Okay, I'll quickly go to examples from other countries, and then we move on to the next part of my lecture. Okay. Of course, uh, this I share it with my students as well. This is supposed to be supposedly the oldest uh, uh, masonry construction, uh, the uh, vault in uh, Tiranis in uh, Greek. Uh, it's supposed to be 1400 uh, years uh, before the current era. Okay. But in my opinion, there are fantastic uh, buildings in uh, in India, okay, which are probably even older than this, okay. especially the Harappa and Mahanjara road sites in the uh, uh, Dolavira and the um, quite a few examples in, in India, the Nalanda University and things like that. This is a very, very interesting, one of the first, uh, first ever multi-storied uh, buildings, much before RCC became very popular. Okay. Uh, it is a 16-storied multi-storied building, of course. Okay. This is the, uh, now of course it's a heritage building. The World Heritage Building. It's the Monadnock Building in Chicago. It's there even today. Okay, uh, so one of my student, former student in Chicago, uh, he shared a few color pictures of this. Okay, perhaps in my next presentation I will be able to include the color picture of this. Uh, it's a 16-story building. Of course, at this point in time, it was constructed way back in 1891. At this point in time, uh, the knowledge of structural masonry was not uh, not fully blown. Uh, so the wall thickness at the base was uh, 1.82 meters, okay, as, uh, as much as six foot at the base. As you go towards the top, the wall thickness reduced, of course. But uh, this is where the turning point of masonry started in, in terms of the structural uh, engineering. Uh, very quickly, there was a healthy uh, competition between uh, America and Europe. Okay, people quickly started understanding the concept of stability-based design. Uh, in the sense that when you take four walls of a masonry building and integrate the four walls, uh, it is not the thickness uh, alone which is going to add to the uh, stability. Okay, it's the configuration which makes it uh, stable. So this concept was very quickly understood. And when I say quickly, relatively quickly understood, and um, in University of Edinburgh, okay, uh, a lot of works on masonry is still going on. A fantastic example of a five-story building full-scale building constructed and experimental building. Wall thickness is about 
100 millimeter four inches and all the floors were loaded and uh, if you notice this very carefully one of the wall the load bearing wall in the ground floor was removed after loading all these things yet the uh, building remained in a stable condition okay so this was to demonstrate the fact that load bearing masonry has got several or many uh, alternate load paths it has got good amount of uh, redundancy structural redundancy it's quite simple for me to explain okay i wish i could have presented that in a, in a uh, open uh, session not the uh, live session if you consider four walls of a uh, building uh, constituting a box type or a rectangular uh, room if you remove any two opposite walls the building should still remain in equilibrium that is the uh, stability based design okay so that's what is uh, uh, stated uh, exclusively uh, in the, the is code okay so the box type of construction is as the one which is uh, supposed to be very stable so this concept was understood and uh, uh, in europe okay the 16 story building came the wall thickness reduced dramatically from 1.82 meters to 200 mm again the uh, uh, competition led to cleveland constructing an 18 story building with 200 mm wall thickness 150 mm wall thickness okay and then from then onwards it has been growing significantly uh, people then started understanding that stability need not be achieved only by straight lines here is a fantastic example of uh, of a building masonry building uh, where it's very interesting if you look at the plan it is sinusoidal if you take a vertical section it is uh, hyperbolic parabola okay so so the concept of stability was completely understood by architect eladio dieste okay uh, was inspired by yet another famous architect by name uh, antonio uh, antonio gaudi i'm going to devote a few slides on on his architecture Uh, marvels as well antonio gaudi in my opinion has is the architect who completely exploited masonry to, to its complete potential okay uh, so much so that architects uh, there are quite a few architects who think that his architecture was, was quite organic in nature okay uh, deeply inspired by human forms okay and animal forms uh here is one of the famous uh, buildings in barcelona okay uh, it looks like uh, bones okay and each of them is a base of uh, and this is a load bearing masonry structure you can see such intricate and complex arrangement of this uh, masonry uh, elements okay so uh, this is a, i mean a better picture of that okay so you can see the columns okay and you can see the uh, sort of the elements it's, it goes beyond the human imagination okay so uh, <clears throat> uh what is interesting is uh, antonio gaudi had complete understanding uh, of uh, masonry uh, he recognized the fact that okay no part of the masonry structure should be developing any tension uh, he came out with a fantastic uh, tool okay he did, he did this with the help of experiments uh, he was supposedly an artist okay uh, in his studio in his back in his studio he took several strings and attached uh, lead shots uh, in sachets to that to that and then created uh, tensile forms uh, from the ceiling it was hung, hung from the ceilings okay and you know uh, when when you take a string and subject it to a load okay it is going to develop pure tension there won't be anything else okay a cable a catenary okay is an example of it. your tension material so he created this fantastic forms in the inverted uh, position okay and he projected this on the uh, wall okay and then painted them and then inverse them to get such structures okay so when you invert them like each of them if it is subjected to pure tension obviously each of them will be subjected to pure compression no tension at all here there is no compression at all when you invert them or going to end up with no no tension at all okay such was his intuitive intuitive understanding okay of uh, masonry okay so unfortunately he was not able to construct this i mean finish this building even uh, to this day I mean, you can see these uh, towers okay uh, the last few spires of this building was, uh, was not constructed so now it is completed i believe okay fantastic uh, towers very slender okay 
uh, you, you see a picture of this. Okay? Uh, every component is subjected to pure compressions. The concept of stability and compression is completely exploited. exploited. Of course, one might wonder that okay, that it's an architecturally uh, pleasing building. It may not have any uh, functional usage. Okay, so, but here are a few more examples. Uh, here is a church, okay, and uh, you can configure the uh, vertical elements not necessarily vertically. Okay, it could be inclined to take up the inclined forces. Okay, the roof was also made of masonry, ribbed roof masonry. You can. Carefully notice, okay, that the uh, the roof is made of uh, ribbed construction. Okay, it's a coffered ceiling kind of thing. Okay, so uh, I, I, this is a picture which amazes me. Okay, uh, virtually, okay, uh, every aspect of masonry is seen here. Okay, uh, the, you can see on the left hand side, okay, uh, the disposition of the masonry units. Okay, uh, variety of uh, unposed durable uh, stone, and you see brick okay and then you can see the coarse one okay you see uh, clay tiles okay and you see an arch you see a vault okay you see an inclined member you see a ripped member is okay virtually everything uh, in mason which is ever possible is seen over here okay just by knowing the fact that it can withstand only compressive forces okay? nothing else okay? so uh, and here is yet another example okay so i can go on and on and on about this and doing about this structure but, the, uh, but that's the point which I'm trying to now make is okay that uh, uh, despite the fact that it has got a lot of structural limitations in the sense that it does not have any tensile strength as such, one need not be constrained by the fact that it has got no tensile strength. You can configure okay, the structure in a manner that the structure itself does not develop any tension. Okay, that's what I just wanted to highlight here. Of course, uh, uh, since about uh, uh, seven decades, uh, seven decades back, okay, reinforced masonry has come into picture. The advantages of uh, RCC has been brought into the masonry. So you can embed the uh, reinforcement in the hollow portion. Okay, so fantastic structures have been constructed. Again, Eladio Diaz-Estate was inspired by Gaudi. He started constructing reinforced masonry. In Western countries now today, okay, there is this concept of pre-stress masonry also. In India, we still have a long way to go. Okay. Uh, New Zealand is a country which is well known for masonry. Okay. New Zealand, like all of you know, that it's an earthquake prone region. Okay. And their masonry success are uh, earthquake resistant. They have gone a far away ahead in masonry. Okay. So I'll come to a few more uh, modern day practices in uh, developed countries. Okay. While those were architectural examples, one might argue about their architectural functionality. I'm going to talk about the conventional, the modern day requirement of buildings. Okay. Um, you can see in the picture, uh, the hollow concrete block. Okay. Uh, even in India, hollow concrete block is extensively used. It's available now, engineered hollow concrete blocks. You get them in variety of shades and textures and sizes and the shapes. Okay. So, and the advantage with uh, hollow concrete block is that it brings in the advantage of concrete and uh, masonry. Okay, so masonry you don't need formal. Okay, concrete you can you need uh, reinforcement to be poured into uh, concrete to be poured into, into the hollow portion. The hollow concrete block itself acts like a formal. Okay, you can replace the reinforcement and pour the concrete, and you can also have the reinforcement. So this is the uh, the modern day uh, advantage of masonry. Okay, you bring in the advantages of concrete and masonry. Okay, so you can dispense with uh, uh, structurally redundant materials. Every component now becomes efficient. Okay, so and you, you see the construction practices in, in the Western countries is different in the sense that they, uh, they they don't rely on uh, covering up their mistakes with plastering and then things like that. So as the construction progresses, progresses, okay, so the cleanliness is maintained. You don't need to wash the uh, surface and things like that. Okay, so the construction practice. This itself is very different. Okay, so I will come to the fourth part of my uh, lecture. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this in the, uh, in, in the both in the rural context and in the urban context, and then I'm going to make make out a case that it's it's a truly sustainable construction. Uh, 
uh, fortunately, I've seen what in quite a few um, of the uh, projects. Okay. Uh, I'm going to discuss a few of them and then uh, end my session with uh, some concluding remarks and open up the session for discussion. Okay. It was about uh, more than a decade back, um, nearing uh, 15 years back, then we, we were wondering that okay, uh, why is that Mason B is not such a popular uh, construction material in a modern context. Uh, with, uh, with quite a few people who have been working on masonry, we, we started a small resource center. Or it was more like a study center, but we called it a structural masonry resource center okay, in BMS College of Engineering. People who were working on structural masonry, either as, as an academic uh, progress or for the research and things like that. So we started interacting, and then since then, a uh, lot of uh, Knowledge has been assimilated in this BMS SMRC. I'll be more than glad to stay, share whatever little knowledge we have gained over the period of several years. Okay. Um, and Professor Jagdish has also authored uh, the book on mas structural masonry. It's also available. Uh, okay, now I will come to this rural context. Okay. Uh, these are a few examples which may not, which may not be awe inspiring, okay, but nevertheless. Uh, very crucial and very vital is what I feel. Uh, this, uh, when I've been associated with this uh, architectural age in um, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, housing problems in India. I think we all know this poverty has led to a lot of people uh, being homeless. Okay. Uh, this is a village in uh, Tamil Nadu. Okay. Although it's in Kanchipuram district, it's closer to Chennai, just about 70 kilometers away from Chennai. Uh, there are uh, um, 26 uh, families who used to live in this village and a few years back there was uh, severe uh, rainfall and quite a few of these buildings were flooded. Okay. In fact, you can notice the building is hardly about 4 feet in height. Okay. The wall, whatever wall you can see here, it's about 3 or 4 feet. You need to crawl inside this. I uh, had an opportunity to study on these things and also went there several times. Uh, it, despite the fact that it looks very rustic, it's quite comfortable inside. Okay, and they attach a roof. Uh, but the fact is, uh, it's it's a it's a poor man's building. Okay, the people are, are aspiring for uh, what is now an English name, a pakka building. Okay, uh, a robust building. Okay, so they did not have ample amount of money to construct a, uh, a robust building. Okay, so they they continue to live inside this. Uh, it's just the four walls okay, and that's roof. Um, virtually the kitchen and the toilet, everything was outside. Only for sleeping, they used to go inside. Okay. This then we uh, uh, sort of engaged with the villagers there and then we started talking about what they need and how, how can they get what they need. Okay. We started talking about the process of uh, them making their own construction materials and products. Okay. We trained them on how to make their own bricks. Okay. Stabilized mud block has come a long way, okay, uh, thanks to uh, the team of uh, Professor Chakdish and Dr. Yogananda, Dr. Vikram Ramreddy, and quite a few researchers in, in the Institute of Science. Okay. Stabilized mud block, a fantastic uh, uh, research, okay, and now it has become a product in the process. Many people have started using it. Okay. So uh, you you take soil, okay, and uh, such that it has got the right ingredients to be uh, used or uh, to be mixed with uh, cement. Okay, so the clay content has to be very less, less than fifteen percent. Should have a dominant sand and silt content. You mix it with cement, okay, and then uh, pour it in into a mold. If you compact it using a compacting machine, then you are going to get stabilized mud block. If you are compacting with your human effort, then it's got a stabilized adobe. Okay. So, stabilized mud block needs a compacting device. Okay, there are a lot of machines available, uh, stabilized mud block making machines. There are also hydraulically operated mud block making machines, electrically operated ones as well. But here is an example of the mud blocks being made by human effort. The villagers were trained how to uh, engineer the soil okay, to get the right amount of sand, silt, and clay, and then mix, mix it with uh, cement okay, and then get the uh, right. Uh, Workability to be poured into the mold, okay, and then uh, pour it and compact it and eject the mold. It's a five-sided mold, okay. You can uh, eject the top side of this mold okay? and then stack it okay? 
and then cure it. So each time uh, one single mold, uh, you can make one uh, one brick. Okay. So the people were trained how to make these bricks. Uh, so this was uh, something which is very interesting that uh, the they were uh, empowered to make their own uh, bricks. Okay. So the the labor cost was not there. Okay. Locally available soil was engineered. It was only the little bit of money which went into the cement. Okay. Eight percent of the uh, eight percent cement. Okay. So that was the only thing which was used, and they were trained to construct uh, masonry walls, and eventually they created this. Okay. One of the first examples. Okay, out of the fifteen buildings which they wanted to do, the first one came up, and immediately the three uh, came up. And looking at the um, uh, the comfort of this uh, and or the economic viability of this. Uh, six more buildings came up. Okay, today there are nearing 15 such houses. And what is interesting is the neighboring villages. They also come and see this, and they want this technology to be implemented in their villages. Okay, so that's the advantage. Uh, even today, uh, in any of the uh, circles you, you contact any architect or a structural engineer, the most economical construction is the low-tech system. There is no doubt about. And if you try to expose it without any blasting, it's, it becomes even more economical. Of course, roof is a costly component, expensive component. Foundation is also quite tricky. Okay. So I just wanted to tell about the success story of this. Uh, it was uh, repeated in quite a few villages in, in, uh, in, uh, in Karnataka. Okay. In Chikpalapur, there is one village called Udagiri Nulla Okay, So they never had uh, ample amount of funds for constructing their houses. They were trained in making these uh, bricks. Okay. They started making these bricks as a uh, uh, in a cooperative mode, okay, so to say. So they started making their bricks and they stacked it whenever they were free from the ag agrarian activities. So they started making these bricks. The women also participated. Okay. So they started making these bricks and then started constructing. Stone is something which is extensively available over there. They use it for lintels and then even for the roof also they started using it. This is yet another example very near to Bangalore in Anakal Taluk. Dr. Yogananda was one of the first to promote this and then showcase the advantage of stabilized adobe. Okay. Uh, he was one of the first to do this. Okay. Uh, so thanks to Dr. Yogananda and his team. Okay. So it has become uh, a sustainable technology for many of the villages. In Karnataka, okay, there are a lot of uh, deposits of laterite stones and then, okay, so here is yet another example of uh, a building in Udupi, which otherwise was done in laterite stones, but the interlocking um, blocks were available. Okay, with thin joints, they were able to construct this uh, building. Okay. Okay, here is an example of similar architecture, but like laterite stones. I come to a few examples in the semi-urban and urban segment. Okay. Uh, uh, this is not stabilized adobe, it is a compacted, okay, compressed stabilized block or what we call it a stabilized block. Okay. This is uh, the DRRT school uh, constructed by, uh, funded by Padmasri uh, Anita uh, So this is a school building in the uh, village in Chikpadapur, uh, village in Chikpadapur district. Okay. So this school building was constructed with a lot of alternatives, okay, the cost came down. And they, of course, uh, one of the important environmental parameters is the embodied energy. Okay. So I'll discuss something about the uh, energy uh, calculations, and cost calculations towards the last part of the lecture. Okay. There is a dome also for the architectural beauty. Okay. So you can see the load bearing elements dispersed. Okay. It's an exposed masonry. Uh, the roof was also made of, uh, uh, roof is of course a flat roof. Okay. So to Enhance the structural efficiency below the neutral axis. Um, there was a filler material, and the filler material was also made of stabilized material. Okay. This is the interior view of the classrooms. Okay. So, exposed masonry. Uh, and you can also see the configuration of the masonry walls. Okay. Uh, the no wall is very long. Okay. There is a cross wall to keep it stable. Okay. So, uh, at another complex, uh, at, at another building in the same complex. Okay. So, <clears throat> Uh, this is again uh, quite a few uh, developers and then uh, manufacturers are coming out with engineered products. Okay, uh, 
quite a few cement uh, industries are also coming out with such products. Okay, Shoba developers, Exxon concrete blocks, okay? SP concrete products, Ultra Deck. They are all coming out with engineer tricks, okay? Besser concrete block. This is uh, an example of engineered hollow concrete block. Okay, mm -hmm. so there is a housing complex near the outskirts of Bangalore. They are not adopted this technology. Uh, it's uh, because the block is so uniform and so neat in finish. Uh, you you have got very less consumption of mortar. Okay, uh, as opposed to conventional table mortar brick where you may need perhaps about twenty five percent of mortar in a volume. This needs only about three to five percent. Okay, so water consumption is also reduced, and you don't need plastic. Okay, so uh, okay, so uh, and wherever uh, required, you can introduce the reinforcement and pour concrete. So this is the advantage. Okay, and even for the lintels, there's a specially made blocks. Okay? And uh, you see my two good friends in this picture. Professor Ranganath is a concrete technologist. Okay. So he was the one who designed the self-compacting concrete for the lintel block. Okay, so he's sort of testing his own product. Okay, so these are the lintel blocks. Okay? So eventually, this these buildings were completed. These are all exposed basically. Okay, uh, while the first example which I took in Kottamedu was a completely rural building. This is a completely urban building. This is a platinum rated building. Okay, so by PCIL, the developers PCIL. Okay, so one of the first platinum rated building as a load bearing uh, misery system. Of course, you've got the modern uh, clay products, okay? uh, the Wiener Burger, okay? Lafarge, they are all coming out with fantastic clay products. Kerala and other places are well known for making clay products. Uh, in Kunigal and Tumku, there are a lot of uh, clay um, block making uh, factories. They also uh, bring in the advantage of a reduction in the dead weight. And they are all hollow, okay, and they are all quite beautiful. You don't need to plaster them. Yet another example of this uh, institutional building in Mysore, the Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement campus in Mysore. Uh, they wanted a cheap plus three story building, okay, without RCC frame system. We brought in the advantage of uh, reinforced masonry, okay. So, wherever there is a large span where a beam was necessary, the beam was resting on a reinforced masonry column. So you don't need formal there. So you still go ahead with the advantage of masonry. So once you reach a certain level, of course the reinforcement is pre-placed, okay, and you pour concrete, and then you are going to get the uh, mobilization of the advantage of concrete, compressive strength and tensile strength. This building was completed, though only two floors have been constructed. It has been designed as cheapest three-story. Of course, it's an exposed masonry. Uh, you see a textured. Uh, uh, putty and then painting over there. Okay, so one of the, uh, in fact, uh, I also have some numbers on the cost saving. Okay, so they save quite a lot of uh, money on this. Okay, uh, so much so that it is quite significant. Okay, so they they were able to uh, add uh, quite a large footprint because of that cost uh, reduction. Okay, uh, looking at the advantage and beauty of this. Okay, quite a few uh, people in Mysore are inspired. They started constructing their own houses using this. Okay, so take another example. Uh, there is an engineer uh, uh, in, in Mysore who was also inspired by this. Okay, he. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm running late, uh, Madam Ramit. Uh, uh, am I on, on schedule? Yes, sir. Okay. We still yeah. have 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. okay. I I think I should be able to come to 15 minutes. Uh, I just want to take a couple of minutes here. Okay. Uh, this is Mr. Nagendra in Mysore. He used to travel in front of this SVYM complex. Okay. Uh, and uh, whenever he used to travel, he used to stop by and then have a look at this. And then he used to interact with us. Okay. And I was also fortunate to interact with him. He's an electronic engineer. Okay. Uh, he wanted to construct his own extension of his house using such products. And then I just want to narrate not exactly a story and narrate a fact, sir which is also sort of uh, eye-opener for me. And uh, he designed his own uh, uh, part, uh, the functional design was done by him. And then he came out with a color coding for different types of blocks to be placed at the right positions. Okay. So these were the palette of blo blocks which are available from the manufacturer. He used all these things and came out with a color coding. Okay, So 
the lintel block was red and the uh, wall beam was uh, blue and then the corner half block and full block and things like that all of them he color coded and he came out with okay with the fact that he needs 1418 blocks okay and typically like all engineers when somebody says i need 1418 blocks he say why don't you buy 1500 blocks and he said uh, why is that i need 1500 blocks and i need 1418 uh, honestly, I must admit that it is an eye opener in the sense that coming from an electronic background, their products, if it needs 10 resistors and five capacitors and whatnot, okay, it's precisely that. Okay, in a mechanical engineering component, if you need 10 screws and 10 bolts, precisely that, you don't need extra. Okay, here is something which is uh, uh, very important if you need 1418, why you need one extra STD thing? Okay, we always tend to take things for granted. Okay. Uh, our planning is not not uh, not correct. We tend to go by a lot of wastages. Okay, and to that extent, our construction process is quite un unscientific and I would say unsustainable. Also, there's a lot of construction waste which is uh, which is uh, produced okay, during the construction process itself. Of course, demolition waste is something different. During the process of construction itself, there are a lot of wastages. So here was an engineer who ensured that not a single brick was wasted. Uh, in fact, even to this day, on the day uh, that his housewarming was done, just to sa satiate our ego, he had ordered for 1,420 blocks and he kept two blocks okay, to demonstrate that okay, he had used exactly 1,480 blocks. Okay. That's a truly sustainable way of doing it. Okay. Masonry offers that, that aspect of sustainable construction. Okay. No wastage in mortar. Okay. He had designed a template. Okay. We are, we are also trying to uh, tell people to use such a type of template, okay? And then no basis of water. So in hollow concrete block, one of the uh, um, sort of issue which we uh, felt, which uh, the masons felt was that when they placed the mortar, it go, used to go inside the hollow portion. Scooping it out was difficult, okay? So he came out with a template such that it does not get, uh, get wasted, okay? So eventually his building was constructed, in a truly sustainable manner. So it was completed. I just wanted to tell that it's yet another aspect of masonry, it needs to be exploited to its complete potential. Okay. We still have a long way to go. Okay. Mm, architect Rajesh Jain in Mysore has been constructing uh, uh, using extensively uh, this uh, interlocking blocks inspired by Lego blocks and uh, uh, conscious uh, towards sustainability. So he's been using uh, uh, the advantage of mud blocks and the advantage of interact, uh, interlocking blocks here. Okay. So, and this is a wall which I literally saw, which was constructed within half an hour up to the lintel level. Once it comes to the lintel level, you place a precast lintel, pour concrete, and then complete it. Okay. So, um, uh, Sri Anar Ashok in Mysore also also has contributed a lot to this product. It's yet to be accepted completely. Uh, I, I presume that this would be a technology of the future, if not for a few buildings, certainly for more, more buildings. Uh, of course, stabilized mud block has come, come a long way. Uh, any complicated shape and architectural form can be done. It is not necessary that the floor plans have to be identical. Okay? So these are a few, exa few of the examples. And it it also emulates, uh, um, uh, generates a local uh, job. Okay? Um, skill sets are enhanced. Okay. So decentralization of uh, manufacture. Okay. So this is an example of a vault <coughs> uh, being constructed using stabilized mud. Okay. So I'll quickly run through this. <coughs> I'll come to the last part of this. Okay. Get another example of uh, one uh, one engineer in Mysore okay, uh, who constructed his, his own house. Uh, so embodied energy is one parameter okay, which we talk about when, when we discuss something about the ecological parameters. Uh, embodied energy is the total amount of energy which goes into the building, okay, right from its uh, manufacturing stage to transportation, erecting and constructing it. Okay. Uh, typically, RCC buildings, typical framed RCC buildings, the embodied energy is something like about uh, 3 to 4 gigajoules per square meter. I'm talking about buildings. Whereas with masonry, engineered masonry, you can bring it as low as one gigajoule per uh, square meter. Okay. That's the amount of advantage which you can derive using engineered products. 
Uh, it was during this construction that one of my um, uh, research colleague, Dr. Varsha, <coughs> who is now my colleague also, okay, who was uh, pursuing her uh, PhD, and we started trying to understand uh, the benefits of masonry vis a vis its embodied energy. Uh, it was not surprising, of course, during the initial part, we thought that it's uh, complicated because we, it was it was quite complicated in, the, in terms of uh, research. Okay, something which was very interesting was. Uh, she studied a whole lot of uh, uh, variety of uh, building forms, load bearing masonry, partially load bearing masonry, moment resisting frames, monolithic structures, pre cut structures. Okay, so we tried to understand uh, the influence of cost and energy. Something which is uh, very interesting is if you want to reduce the embodied energy, okay, automatically the cost also comes down. Something which is amazing. Okay? Or if you want to reduce the cost, automatically the embodied energy. The revealing thing for us that uh, Masonry offers a lot of uh, potential okay, if you want to do sustainable construction practices. Most of the uh, building typologies which you see in the study by Varsha, okay, they, are, they belong to a class of uh, load bearing masonry systems. Okay? That, that indicates that okay, it's, it's a truly sustainable material. Okay? So, with that, I come to some uh, concluding remarks. Okay? Uh, I, I feel that I'm running out of uh, my time. I, I think I'm. Uh, I feel that okay, when people have to talk about sustainable construction practices, okay, we have to be re look at masonry. It has got a lot of potential despite it being a historic material. It has been uh, uh, its complete potential has not been exploited in two, uh, in in my understanding. Okay, so. I think that's what okay. Uh, I see unfortunate buildings, even single story uh, buildings being constructed in concrete, which is uh, which is a pity. Okay? So because uh, a job can be done with masonry with uh, probably one one tenth the cost. Okay, so there are a lot of uh, government sponsored projects which have been done like this. I feel it's it's not it's incorrect. Okay, monolithic concrete has got its own role to play okay, for multi story buildings. There is no doubt about it. Okay, so I call this as a disproportionate technology. Use masonry wherever it is possible. Okay, use concrete wherever it is needed. Use steel wherever it is needed. Okay, is the point at which I would highlight. Okay, and on that note, I would end my lecture. Okay, so again, I was inspired by Professor Gudaisma's uh, some of the words. Okay, which he has been always been using. I do uh, the tenets of sustainability is reduce, reuse, and recycle. Okay. I also feel that okay, uh, we, there's time has come for us to refuse certain technologies, reinvent uh, earlier technologies, rethink, okay, repair, rehabilitate, retrofit. Okay. Most importantly, respect natural resources. Thank you for the patient listening.